Hi everyone. This is just a brief refresher on the six Enlightenment philosophers that we've looked at here in class and uh, just trying to explain how the Enlightenment period fits in with really the rest of European history. So if you'll recall, going way back, the Roman Empire falls and that leads to a long period of chaos where there are very few leaders who are strong enough to unite people together. There are barbaric tribes attacking, people are starving, and as a result, a system is needed to reorganize European society now that the Roman Empire is gone. And that system is feudalism, and that's where we have kings, lords, knights, and then serfs at the bottom, and everybody in there has their own responsibility. For the system to work, everybody has to be doing their job, everybody has to be willing uh, to work together. Uh, within that system, the lords really have most of the control on a day-to-day -day basis. The kings have a small area of land, but they aren't super powerful kings. Uh, that's followed up by uh, a couple of things that really get rid of feudalism. Uh, the first is the Black Death. The Black Death kills so many people that the system of feudalism cannot continue to function the same way. The second thing is the um, Crusades. Uh, the Crusades um, really starting at right about 1100 CE and lasting for, you know, about 200 years, depending upon what source you read. That allows some of these monarchs to gain more power and more control over their societies than ever before. They kind of become rock stars. Um, those two things combined with um, the influx of knowledge during the time period of the Renaissance sees kings start to take more power than ever before. This is during the age of absolutism. Um, just a quick note, these aren't hard and fast dates. They overlap to some degree. It's not like all of a sudden 1350 hits and boom, no feudalism in Europe. Um, so we just need to kind of understand the flow of history, not necessarily specifically when they start and when they end. During the age of absolutism, we see rulers like Louis XIV, Peter the Great, who are going to take complete control over much larger areas than ever before. Um, Louis XIV is going to control the nobles to make sure that they can't take away any of his power, like the nobles of England did using the Magna Carta. Uh, he builds the palace at Versailles outside of Paris, so the nobles have to come to him. Peter the Great in Russia uh, believes that westernizing slash modernizing is the way for Russia to move, so he builds brand new cities, St. Petersburg. Uh, he starts to follow a lot of Western ways and traditions, and he actually orders men, uh, Russian men, to shave their beards off as a way to try and show progress within Russia. But the point is these people have complete control over their societies. And we're naturally going to see people start to rebel against that. Typically, nobody likes to be ruled by somebody else um, very heavy-handedly for a long period of time. Um, and we'll see how the Enlightenment rebels against that. Uh, the last thing is the scientific revolution. You can see it kind of overlaps. It's also overlapping with the age of exploration, where European uh, countries are sending people all around the world, people like Columbus and um, John Cabot and Amerigo Vespucci and Bartolomeo Diaz, uh, Hernan Cortez conquering the Aztecs. Um, that's going to overlap with the scientific revolution where you have people who are trying to look at the world around us in a much different way than ever before. 1517, Martin Luther posts the 95 Theses on the door in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, that's going to eventually lead to the Protestant Reformation. And the scientific revolution kind of follows on that heels because it's a, a time period where there's a lot of religious upheaval. People aren't really sure um, what type of religion they're going to follow. They're all going to follow some sort of Christian religion for the most part within Europe. But people aren't really sure, like, do I go Protestant? Do I try Calvinism? Am I still going to be Catholic? Um, and the scientific reformers, they're going to look at the world around them and start to try and apply logic and reason over um, just kind of tradition. They're going to move away from the Renaissance ideas of looking back at Greek and Roman architecture and art and literature and move into their own, trying to build upon that, trying to make things better. That same logic and reason that the scientific reformers are going to use, people say, well, why can't we apply that to the way that humans act? Why can't we apply that to the way that governments work? And that's really where the Enlightenment comes in. All of these time periods are working towards building to um, people starting to examine the societies in which they live. Thanks to the printing press in 1455, more people are going to have access to books and essays than ever before. So during the period of the Enlightenment, people are able to read and learn and consider and think about the way that their society works. And so that's going to have a big impact on Europe, and we'll see that a few times throughout the course of the year. So to those philosophers themselves, 
Uh, we're going to start off with Thomas Hobbes here. Uh, Thomas Hobbes writes Le The Leviathan. He's an absolutist. He says that people live short, nasty, brutish lives. And left to their own devices, people are going to make selfish, de selfish decisions that benefit only themselves. As a result, you need a strict government to keep control. That's the only way. You can't trust that people are just going to do what's right because the majority of the people aren't going to do that. So you need to make sure that you have strict government in order to keep them under control. John Locke is going to kind of respond to Thomas Hobbes a little bit. He says, no, 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 humans are logic and rational. And all humans are born with natural rights, life, liberty, and he says property. Uh, eventually, that's going to be used in the Declaration of Independence, uh, where it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But no government, no, even if it's an absolute, absolute monarch, can take those things away from you. And so as a result, he advocates for a government that is going to secure those rights of the people to make sure that those rights aren't taken away. Baron de Montesquieu is going to look at the setup of the government, the system, how it works. He advocates for separation of power, balance of power. Again, they're looking at these absolutist monarchs and saying, no, that's not the way we want to do things. So his idea is to separate into three different branches, the legislative branch that makes the laws, the executive branch that enforces the laws, and the judicial branch that makes a determination regarding those laws. Those three branches are what are eventually going to be adopted by the United States of America in, their con in our Constitution. Um, he believes that those branches will keep any one person from gaining too much power. Again, going back against the age of absolutism that had previously been there. Jean-Jacques Rousseau is going to go kind of a step further. He's going to say it's not just about government versus citizens. He says the government and the citizens, they make a contract. The citizens are willing to give up some of their rights to just do whatever they want. And in return, the government's job is to ensure that their rights are protected by all. Um, the natural rights that John Locke discussed to make sure that those are secured. And he says that if they are not secured, then you need to kind of scrap things with the government and try again. Um, he says that humans are naturally good. They want to do good. And so therefore, it should be the will of the people that guide government's decisions. It shouldn't ju just be one person doing what they want and what's best for them. It should be the will of the people that allows the government to rule and that makes those decisions or helps to make those decisions for the government. That brings us to Voltaire. Uh, Voltaire is going to rebel against inequality in a couple of different ways. He's a common man, but he takes the name Voltaire, is Francois-Marie Arame. He takes the name Voltaire as a way to try and join the higher level social circles within Paris. And he's trying to convey the idea that you're, you're standing in life. You're position in society is not just based on where you're born, but what you have to say and how you think, and that nobody's right to think should be taken away or taken lightly. It doesn't matter who you were born to. Uh, he's going to advocate for freedom of religion as well, that the government should not be in the business of making those decisions. He's going to advocate for the freedom of speech, that the government should not be able to throw you in jail if they don't like what you have to say. Voltaire actually travels over to England and sees the way England is set up with their constitutional monarchy. and. Um, leaves France. He's, well, he's kicked out of France. Um, but he's really pushing for some of those ideas on co continental Europe, like France, to be applied from England um, to those different places that had been absolutist monarchies. Finally, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, we see she's kind of the late end of this, and she's going to advocate for women's rights. Um, she's going to be around during the French Revolution, after the French Revolution, saying, hey, that's great. We made all these um, plans. We made all the, the civil constitution that we'll talk about when we get to Napoleon, and yet women are still left far behind. And her argument is basically that women are behind because of the education system. Women are not afforded the same education that men are. If they were afforded the same education, then they would show that they are equal to men. And so she's advocating for women's rights, but especially through the educational systems. So those are the six philosophers that are discussed in your readings. And I basically boiled down the um, arguments that each of them are making in those excerpts that you read.